Good morning. How are you guys feeling? Who, uh, who stayed overnight here? Nice, nice. Congratulations. Hope it pays off for you. Uh, so we're going to start by with everyone standing up. I know it's been a long night for some people. Uh, we're going to start by putting your right hand up in the air. Breathe into it and put your left hand up in the air as well. Now, everyone turn to your right. And let your hands, or did I do left, right? Yeah, right, sorry. And let your hands fall on the shoulders of the person in front of you. And use those, those thumbs, those little turbines of yours, just to really rub it out for the person in front of you. They've had a long night. <laughs> You know, don't hold back. They need it. Take advantage of this moment. Yeah, really sink into it. Now, let's put our hands back up in the air. Do a nice spin to the other direction. Can't leave the other person hanging. And return the favor. Yeah, I know you, some of you might be the caboose right now. You know, totally fine. You weren't there a moment ago. Really enjoy it. And now let's settle into the panel. Uh, all right. Good morning, nerds. That is a thing that just happened. Um, my name is Sydney Skybetter. I'm a choreographer and professor of dance junk at Brown University. And it is my uh, privilege to be here. Yeah, go dance junk. Is that what that was? Go Brown. OK, great, sure. <laughs> I don't know, sometimes the dance junk, yeah, dance junk. Okay, uh, you say dance junk, you say brown, dance junk, brown. I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and move on. Uh, it is early, nerds, it is early. Um, so uh, I am really delighted to be here this morning. Um, I uh, have the privilege of sharing uh, three tables across six other nerds, um, and this is a, a really singular experience for me. I'm just uh, honored to be a part of the Hacking Arts experience, so I just wanna extend my thanks first and foremost to my uh, esteemed panelists, and also, of course, to the organizers whose uh, blood, sweat, and tears uh, make this all happen, so thank you and Mazel Tov. Uh, can we give a round of applause for those nerds? They, they could... um, and, and also, of course, just very indulge me for the, the production folks um, who uh, put on those sick discotheque beats just a couple minutes ago, so thank you for your service. Um, so uh, real quick, this is, um, this is going to be a morning panel, uh, so um, it's going to be, uh, I'm gonna be facilitating in the style of fast. Um, so my uh, intention here is to um, put some uh, soft but also hard parameters around um, folks' uh, time and attention and uh, guide our conversation through. And ideally, I'd love for uh, you, the audience, to be as involved uh, as possible. Now, I understand that there is a uh, marginally dystopic technology uh, interfacing between us, uh, the Slido, Slido, Slido. Um, so uh, y'all already know how to use the Slido. This is all old school, uh, all old knowledge. You use the uh, hashtag um, uh, pound sign HA2018 interactive uh, on the Slido uh, to post your questions and then they'll pop up in a couple minutes on the Slido screens up here. Um, so I'd encourage you to be as um, vocal, uh, if in mediated fashion, um, as you can. Um, I'm very interested in uh, you being, uh, th this pr panel being uh, informed by your interests and um, experiences, so uh, throw down up in there. Um, so let's do this thing, shall we? We shall. Um, what I'd like to do next uh, is, uh, in one sentence or less, ask my uh, esteemed panelists to uh, give a bio statement. So you have one sentence uh, to tell our audience who the hell you are. Mm. <clears throat> I'm Eli Clark Davis, Chief Production Officer of Daybreaker, an early morning dance community around in 25 cities around the world with 500,000 community members, uh, serving as someone who loves uh, production as well as community building. So we're going to focus on that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I am Ali. I design interactive platforms that enable new user experiences, and I make products that make life easier. Cheers. Yeah. I'm, I'm digging this clapping after people talk thing. Let's keep that up. Yes, hi, good morning. I'm Carl Sims. I create digital simulations, interactive digital simulations with inspiration from nature. Mm. Yeah. 
Hi, I'm Lucy. I'm an interdisciplinary designer and currently a grad student at Harvard focusing on disruptive approach in holistic systems. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, my name is Tobias Putrich. Um, uh, my work is mostly about you know, art, architecture, and design. And um, that's pretty much it. Great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Ryan Edwards. I'm a, a musician and artist and working in the area of uh, light, sound, and interactivity. Great, wow. Um, I have to say, a very virtuosic job uh, keeping to one sentence. There were a couple semicolons in there, but well, well played. Um, so uh, next, what I'd like you to do is, um, again, for my uh, panelists, um, I, given two minutes, I, I'd like you to uh, tell a story about uh, maybe a, a choice uh, project, uh, research venture, uh, intervention of some kind uh, that for you starts to define questions of not only sort of art, um, but also of interaction and how you're thinking about technology. So we're starting to maybe define our terms a little bit. Mm. Two minutes is on the clock. And I should also note by way of caveat, um, I'm going to be um, timing these nerds with my phone. Um, so if I'm looking at my phone, I'm not like checking on the latest, I guess, moth memes or whatever the kids are sharing these days. Um, I'm just going to literally, <laughs> thank you for finding that funny. Um, I'm going to be timing them and giving them a uh, time warning. So on that note, uh, two minutes from my left to my right, please. <clears throat> okay, so at Daybreaker we think about cross collaboration in many ways um, with technology in, is one of the biggest ones. I could think about a specific story where we collaborate with IBM Watson and some incredible artists out in San Francisco. Uh, to create the world's first cognitive dance party where uh, we, the challenge was to make AI more human, less scary. And we did so by having Watson analyze all of the survey data from the attendees coming to Daybreaker, creating personality insights that then determined uh, what, uh, hu what human flow they'd go through in, in the experience, what fitness experience they'd go on, whether they were more of the capoeira, the yoga, or the high intensity interval training type of person, what food they would enjoy at the event, what color they would wear to the event. And then we used all of that data to program functionality in this 30 by 30 foot LED dance floor that we built. Uh, and that functionality was also meant to bring people closer together and make real meaningful human connections and, uh, and also create more energy for people to dance even harder. With that energy that people created, we then rose this uh, 17 foot LED sun that we fabricated behind the DJ booth and simulated the rising sun um, and on top of that, we used the AI to have uh, Watson beat a battle. Um, Elu, this world-renowned jazz pianist, um, we read these intention cards as a community to out loud at the end. Um, and we gave Watson 1,000 of them to then sort through based on the personality insights of the community and chose one specific one that would resonate. So uh, we, it was really a, a practice in just how um, AI can enhance our lives in a really meaningful way and create deep connections with others. Wow. Coming in under time. Thank you, sir. Um, uh, moving on, yes. Sure. So um, I'm a PhD student here at the Media Lab, and I think a lot about um, building platforms that others uh, can uh, uh, design for. So for my master's thesis, which I also did here, I was um, developing a multimodal interactive interface that was focused primarily on haptic feedback and it enabled people to interact with virtual objects on a stereoscopic or volumetric display uh, and whenever their hand comes in contact with a virtual object, they experience sensation where the boundary of the object is. And this is one um, project that falls under this umbrella of a platform that empowers people to develop their own uh, interactive experiences and express their creativity in new ways. Uh, currently, um, one of my projects is actually quite, quite different from what I had done previously. I'm now doing soft robotics, uh, specifically with applications to um, hand augmentation for people with disabilities. So I think a lot about um, design that is inclusive and that um, is accessible to everyone. So my current project uh, um, enables people who have some motor impairments are, are not able to um, grab something with their hand due to inability to bend their fingers to still be able to use their own hand to pick up objects 
um, just by putting their hand over the object and having inflatable uh, actuators um, grab the object and then be able to pick it up and manipulate it. And similarly, if they are able to um, move their fingers only slightly, then using the same approach, um, the actuators are filling the space between the skin and the object so they can use the object with only a very small bending of their fingers. Um, I don't know what happens when you put uh, hashtag fucking bonkers in the Slido, but um, maybe we should try that. Um, thank you, sir. Um, and I, I should note, um, yeah, oh, yeah, shit, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I should note, um, by way of prelude, in a moment I'm going to ask my esteemed panelists to comment on each other's stories and um, projects, so that's uh, coming up next. Uh, sir. So, <clears throat> I am fascinated by emergent behavior, situations where you can create simple rules and apply them either over and over again or across many parts of space, and then you get these unexpected complex results. So, inspiration from nature, I mentioned, um, I guess the grand version of that is life coming from primordial soup, right? So we've, we've, we have an example of that. And that is, to me, fascinating. Um, I'll quickly summarize four different interactive pieces that I've created that relate to this. Um, biology, chemistry, physics types of simulations. One um, is called Genetic Images, which is a um, abstract computer art evolution setup. You're shown a bunch of simple pictures and you're supposed to stand in front of the one you like the most and that one replicates and fills the other screens. So it's a sort of survival of the most aesthetically interesting abstract artworks system and after a while you get more complex interesting pictures. Um, another piece um, is a reaction diffusion chemistry simulation where you have two chemicals that react and diffuse and create these patterns that are fairly unexpected and things like brain coral patterns or even cellular mitosis type patterns out of these very simple chemical rules. This is your 30 um, second warning. That piece is playing at the Science Museum. And then two other pieces, one is involving um, particle systems physics simulation and a fluid flow physics simulation. So those are the kinds of things that I'm into. Okay. Thank you. Round of applause. Work it out. All right, Lucy. Okay. Um, so let me start by saying when Sydney sent me the prom, I freaked out a little because I don't actually know what I'm doing 90% of the time. Um, yeah, because I'm so currently a student and I'm always looking to grant, branch out and looking at all sorts of different designs and I guess my core is, um, as I said before, a disruptive approach to holistic systems. So basically looking at all aspects of everything and trying to find the most unlikelies and kind of smush them together. Um, so yeah, so instead of saying what I guess my belief or what are my projects kind of focus on, I'm gonna say three projects and hopefully people can come up something for me. Yeah, so um, the first project I did was a past uh, virtual reality project and it was a physical reality project slash virtual reality project, whereas um, Sydney knows more about this. It, it was at Brown University in a place called Yurt, where it's like it's a physical space surrounded by about 70 projectors that work as a VR projection system. And I basically implemented a architecture model in it that corresponds to um, the person's virtual movement and create a spatial echolocating sound systems that helps them direct um, through the space through music and notes. So that's one project. Um, another project was, um, it was a material-based uh, fabrication systems where I looked at digital ways of fabricating um, glass as a material in terms of um, under architectural context, basically looking at the innate properties of slumping and casting and how that could be constructed into a fragile, intricate, yet very stable structures that can prevent any further increasement of things like um, linear fractures, et cetera. That's, very utilitarian. So those are the two. And the last project was a more recent project where I worked um, as a 
combination of designer slash cognitive neuroscience person. Basically by taking fMRI brain scan data and using a process of machine learning and JavaScript as a way of processing visualizations to create an interface that displays uh, scanning brain scan information in a more, I guess, easier to understand way. Fantastic. So those are very different projects and right. hopefully, yeah. Yeah, and all that in the in the service of interface, which I'd love to return to. Uh, thank you, Lucy. Yeah, work it out. Um, and I, I also want to just take a moment to point out the slightly obvious um, that there are people taking me uh, literally and at my word uh, up here um, using swear words and asking questions. So uh, as we go, um, we can address that um, if we can, please. Yeah. Um, you know, my you know when you know, I was asked you know for this panel to talk about you know participatory you know kind of idea. I think in art it's very strange, but what, what is that exactly is participation? So, and I was trying to think what my, in my work exactly could be, everything is participatory in a sense. So I, you know, I just want to describe just one simply, you know, one simple project that was about, you know, risk. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to build a stack of styrofoam cubes in a, in a museum in, um, in England. And actually, the whole idea was that working with structural engineers and architects, like to build a stack that's like 10 meters high or more, you know, that could be that could potentially collapse. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and then how how exactly you the whole structures form about this notion of risk, you know, that's basically kind of scientifically kind of you know actually working with structural engineers and trying to calculate percentage of risk. So in how actually then museum reacts to this notion that artwork can collapse. So, you know, and of course, you know, the results, final result of this collaboration with museum, with everyone was that museum actually at the end, you know, glued all the stacks, not telling <laughs> anyone. What? You know? So, you know, it tells you a lot about this kind of participatory and kind of like, you know, notion of like how much institution really, and how institution participate in this kind of, you know, process. Huh. And, you know, because institutions are very conservative in that yeah. sense. And participatory art and design tries to be very open. Mm -hmm. So, and this kind of clash is very interesting that happens. Yeah. And how it happens. Sure. Um, I want to put a pin in and two things that you're talking about. First, indeed, the role of the institution uh, relative to all of our work, I think, is something that we can uh, explicate further. Um, but I, I also am very intrigued by this idea of incorporating corporeal risk uh, into interactivity, um, especially given some of the conversations we were having immediately before the panel, which had to do with creating a, a kind of a safe space or a playful space. And maybe uh, these notions of risk and playfulness are in some kind of relationship, yeah. he said leadingly. Please. Cool. <laughs> right on. Yeah. That sounds a good one, dude. <laughs> um, so my name is Ryan, um, and my background is in West African music. And I bring that up because in West Africa, if you play drums, and this happened to me one of the first times I played drums there, and no one's dancing, they think you're crazy. Because music without dance is like, doesn't happen. It's, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's, that's just a huge question mark. Like, something is wrong. And so that's, I did that, that I experienced that first as a teenager, um, and I, that has kind of like been a part of all of my work as I've gone forward, where uh, as a composer and as a creative, I really seek for um, another media or another person or another, you know, like something to react and feed off of. Um, so that's, that's kind of like the basis of the, how I look at the world in making work. Um, the current project that I'm working on now is a location-aware musical instrument. Um, where uh, it's, a, it's a public artwork that I install. Um, it's a series of plastic cubes. And as people move around these cubes, they actually contribute to the um, melodic structures. So it's location aware in that, say, if uh, this is scan is happening this way, this um, could be rhythm. And as the cubes are moved this way, that could register pitch. So it really is like actually preparing something for interaction, uh, but not finishing it. I think that's something that, like, for me, has become a very strong piece of what I do is that I can't actually um, finish my work. I can only prepare it and set it up for people to play with. And that's really fun. I mean, that's a, in a way, and I'm sure that might be something we all have in common in, in interactivity, is that you, you have to kind of 
prepare for various conditions and then be ready to be surprised and pivot and change and kind of improvise. Um, and that to me keeps my work really interesting and exciting and also like super present, which is how I just want to live. Sure. Cheers. Wow, we got mantras falling down all over the place here. Thank you. Um, no, and I, I, I love this, uh, it's sort of Yvonne Rainery postmodern -y idea of the work never being done exactly, so maybe there's a question as to like when an interface or when an art is finished somehow. Um, I now want to invite um, all of our panelists to now comment on each other's work. Um, so I wonder if you have any questions for each other, uh, maybe potentially invoking some of the um, uh, swear words or other kinds of words um, in the Slido. Uh, what's on your mind uh, as regards your fellow panelists? Anybody, <laughs> please. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, sir. Go ahead, Eli. <clears throat> On direct response to, to Tobias, uh, you know something that we think about at Daybreaker when creating the framework of of these large scale events um, is this Venn diagram mm -hmm. of mystery and safety, and that meeting in the middle is where uh, some of the most some of the greatest magic happens, and it's what keeps people coming back and wanting more, right? Where they they want to play with risk. They they don't. They have no idea what's what's coming. Uh, what could happen? Could they? Could the things collapse? But they also like, they want this element of safety and warmth. Um, and it, I feel like there's just, there's something there with the the art that you're that you're creating as well. Yeah, but look, I think um, many times I think this in institutional rules really kind of dictate what it's possible to do and what is not possible to do. And I think idea of like participatory art and of this kind of, it was always the idea of a different museum, different space where people get, interact with kind of art, interact with each other. And, uh, but to me, you know, interesting, you know, interesting moment that happens is that institutions are always places of, with rules, with very strict rules. So, I think the first question is like, how do you implement these rules? And especially, and I think on the level of, you know, if you have a like small, com like small company, small, I mean, you can improvise, but you're still kind of, you have to fit, right? You have to, you know, you have to obey the rules. Simply it's like when you organize, there's simply the whole infrastructure that you have to follow. Mm -hmm. So, and you know, this is kind of tension. I think it's very interesting. When, where is this freedom of participation and how does it happen? You know, can you step out of this? You know, you talk about safety, but this is very serious thing, you know? It's like, you know, if something goes wrong, you're, you're done, you know? Sure, as so, in dead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, that's kind of, you know, sure. you know, or even like, you know, but probably, you know, if you, because if you go to, you know, some like, Countries that, you know, rules are not that important, <laughs> you know, you suddenly feel like, you know, I was a project, I was at Dhaka Summit in Bangladesh, and, you know, actually it's a beautiful place, and many things are possible there that would never be possible here. And maybe you should try exhibiting at Burning Man instead of museums, maybe. Yeah. There's fewer <laughs> rules, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I, I want to maybe sort of uh, tag on to this uh, question, this conversation, and incorporate um, the question by, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, anonymous. Um, so the question is, is how do you adapt when the audience slash end user leads you down an unexpected path? And, and I might maybe tag on to that uh, audience, end user, or institutional framework. Uh, maybe there's a way that our art working within the world, within or uh, orthogonal to Burning Man or other places, um, has an effect on the work. So I wonder if you can talk uh, about uh, what happens when the audience, end user, or institution leads you down an unexpected path? Mm. Yeah. So I think that plays into your, your, your risk comment also. I think that's what you hope for. Um, I think once, you know, if, if, you, if you can create an interactive piece of some sort where you'd have no clue what might happen, that's great. Unexpected things are wonderful, and sometimes they're not that great, and sometimes they're much greater than you would expect, but that's I think that's a very positive thing for any piece, in my opinion. Thank you. I'll add to that. Um, I think, uh, you, I like what, what you just said about like, you hope that happens. And I think that's like, that's a fundamental piece in anyone's approach. You know, if you think, I'm gonna, I'm gonna provide for all of the contingencies and I'll be ready for it, you know, go, go ahead if you think you could, but I think what's, what's kind of beautiful is not being able to do that or kind of accepting and embracing that. So that would be like the first, step and then um 
and then realize, like, I think on the unfinished thing, that it's unfinished and that's beautiful because then you go back to your studio and like everything you learned from showing it last weekend, you incorporate this week. And you're like, whoa, okay, now I actually need these things because last weekend I wasn't just showing a finished thing and standing there, I was actually researching and participating and like bringing things in mm -hmm. because I'm passionate about developing this so that it's a journey, it's a path rather than like, kunk, all right, what's the next thing, right? And, and that, so that's actually like more about technology and interaction but more about an attitude maybe? Or like a stance. Yeah, sure. like I'm, I'm into the fact that I don't know how it's gonna work mm -hmm. and I'm gonna get information from people interacting with it. Like that's a wonderful shaking that, to happen. Sure. Um, I'm curious, do all of you share that, that vantage point, that kind of improvisatory pliability? Does that, is that something we all agree is uh, important or vital here or useful? Yeah, we consider them the golden moments at Daybreaker where you, uh, you, have, you, know, you set up a framework and you, you hope for people to create their own magic within it. Um, and if it's something that you, know, is, you weren't expecting in a way that might have been a little more challenging, uh, it's one of those moments where the community gets to uh, kind of like self-correct in a way that reinforces um, the community, if you will. Uh, and it's a way for people to feel more a deep, like they feel more connected to the experience by able to, able to react back to it. Sure. Connected, but they also maintain their agency. So they're, they're not, you're not like imposing interaction on them. It sounds like they're uh, there of their own volition. Mm -hmm. Please. Um, <clears throat> I would go perhaps even one step further and say that we should not only think about how to engage the audience in the experience that we design for them, but how can the audience itself be part of the design of the experience itself? So one of the things I, um, one of the philosophies I share a lot uh, has to do with open source and uh, um, um, engaging people in the development of products and um, uh, interactions uh, themselves. So um, uh, it's, it's, it's perhaps one of the suggestions I would have for all of the hackers here is that when you create something, perhaps consider open sourcing it so that you are not limiting the people to only using the particular uh, system or the particular product that you develop, but enable them to remix and expand upon it and develop their own um, uh, um, versions of it, similar, similar to how software works, but we can extend this to hardware and also to, to uh, performances and more general um, scenarios as well. So other, other thoughts, questions for uh, your fellow panelists? Anything that you've been dying to ask each other for literally minutes now? I mean, I kind of want to uh, keep on going with the um, kind of the interface interaction questions, um, like targeted towards all of my panelists. Like, for example, um, I have a question for Ryan, because we've been talking about um, like rules, frameworks, and uh, for example, like taking your box project, for example, like it is like set in a like a space that's like a regular space, like everything is rectangular, and there are different, um, I guess, the boxes are programmed in a way that when people move them, like there's a set coordinate and like relationship between each other. But how do you really decide um, how much rules, I guess, to enforce on the people? Like, um, in a way that you could, like, there's, there's, you can go all the way from, like, yeah, just let them do whatever they want, like, see, like, whatever, like, almost, like, morphic mm -hmm. outcome that comes up mm -hmm. to, okay, I want the lateral element to be this, the linear element to be this, and I want specific, like, chorus slash notes to be composed. Like, how do you, like, I guess my question is to what extent mm -hmm. do you apply those rules and mm -hmm. set people? Um, right on. And maybe to tag on again to um, Anonymous's uh, question about the uh, interactions with the artwork and how you think of the object and its life, uh, life uh, lifestyle? No, yeah. life, uh, <laughs> life cycle. I mean, it has a great lifestyle. I hope <laughs> it has like, hugs all the time. Amazing. <laughs> um, well, the, the, that question, I have, uh, to answer that, I have to back up and ask, like, what, is the, um, what are some of the philosophies? What are the experiences that I want people to have? Um, I mean, the, the quick answer is that I, I program the piece to operate in a number of different ways, both from like kind of confined within parameters so that it's very musical, and then also things that are ex, you know, completely um, organic uh, and, with, and, and removing some of those structures that make it musical. 
but one of the philosophies for me is I, I want to try to create spaces where people um, interact socially with one another. Um, so that, it, to me, is, is the holy grail. Mm -hmm. um, the more that I can help put that into the world, uh, the better. So, so I answer that. Musical structures, uh, and people are more interactive with one another that way then I might go down that path and encourage it. But I also, there's times when people get completely musical playing with it, and I'm like, you know what, I need to completely change this up so that I scramble it, and then they go, whoa, and they start talking to one another. Like, all of a sudden, it's detuned church bells and, and crickets, and that's what they're playing with. And then they're like, are you kidding, what? You know, so that is, to, to that end, um, it's really, th those are the two things that I look for. And I, the, the other thing, too, is like, how, um, is removing the barriers to be musical. I think that's one of the things for me that's really important is, um, you know, you don't have to afford a violin and lessons and go to a school that has an orchestra. How can I democratize music and music making so that people feel the feelings of music um, in uh, unconventional settings and with people they don't know? So if I can make that happen quickly, you know, strangers happen upon this and then now they're being musical, that, that to me is an end goal. So. Not such a concise answer, but those are some of my thoughts on it. But Thanks for the question, Lucy. You're, you're also alluding to interactivity, not just between uh, an installation and an object and a, a, a participant, but also between participants, between uh, communities of participants. Oh, please, yes. <laughs> yeah. Please, yes. Yeah. Get comment cards. But yeah, I mean, so it, it seems like we, <laughs> we, a number of us uh, on the panel have that uh, interest in common. Yeah, we were talking about this earlier. So for me, I love it when a piece can lift sort of an inhibition barrier and cause people to act silly and, and just feel like they can do crazy stuff that they yeah. wouldn't necessarily do walking down the street, but now it's okay, so go for it, right? Way ahead of so, you, bro. Yeah. So some of my works have motion sensors and so on. <laughs> people can you know, dance or be silly. And then, even better, is when you have a few people using it at once, um, they start interacting with each other at the same time as they're interacting with the piece, and that's just fun when that happens. Yeah. And it's great. Yeah. And in fact, you could argue that you know the, the VR goggles are, are very risky yeah. in terms of an experience that can create that kind of interaction because you don't see the person as well. Maybe you can. You see their avatar sometimes. It can work. But I tend to do pieces where people do not wear wear anything at all, so it's a, a digital mirror kind of situation with augmented reality, but not wearing the goggles. Sure. No, what I, what I love about that is it's, it, it positions dorkiness as a kind of utopian virtue. Um, and it highlights awkwardness and play as uh, aspirational. He said with a question mark. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Did I get that one right? Um, so I just want to uh, kind of call the process because there, there's been a, now a number of uh, instances where my esteemed panelists have uh, gestured towards um, you know, reducing barriers and talking about playfulness. Um, and uh, sort of procedurally, here we are on a stage uh, with bright lights so we can't fall asleep, and you are in a dim space and comfortable chairs where you can fall asleep. Um, and so, I, and also our relationship is entirely mediated by this delightful, um, if frankly distancing, technology. Um, so I just wanted to kind of like maybe go off mic or something for a moment and ask how the hell are you doing? And is this useful or interesting? Should we use more swear words, fewer swear words? Uh, what, what, what's good for you? What you how, how are we doing here? A couple thumbs up, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess this isn't the best uh, way to ask for long form criticism exactly, but <laughs> it's like so, well it's not really a question. Um, but I also, uh, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and, and go to the screen here, because um, we have uh, a couple requests with four thumbs up uh, for Daybreaker at MIT with I think five or six exclamation points, so I think, uh, I don't write the bylaws, but I think that means that that has to happen. <clears throat> yeah, okay, there's some support for that. Um, I guess, uh, Let's see, uh, what was the main guidance for uh, Watson's analysis of Daybreaker, the Daybreaker community? So I guess maybe this is a question um, ultimately about a kind of algorithmic processing. Um, and I guess I'm, I'd, I'd extend this to you all. I'm curious how you um, either think about the design or engineering or the curation of algorithms or uh, of the, uh, the math behind your work. Um, how do you code for interactivity? I hired somebody to help me do that. <laughs> um, Asked and answered. <laughs> yeah, but I would say that um, that it, it matters a lot. First of all, that obviously that's you know someone you can trust and that you can co-collaborate with, um, and also that you empower. Um, and and I think for me that's something that to think of my work not as my name but as a team has helped that. And then also for me personally, 
you know, kind of creating the software for me to work with that remains expressive. Um, and I think that's, and, and, and kind of continuing just to my, my earlier point about being able to kind of develop it a, as it goes, creating that kind of an environment where it's, it isn't something that's like, again, it's not finished. It's like, I don't know what I'd want to do next weekend. Let's make sure that we have some options. Great. That's been my approach to that. Mm. Thank you. Other thoughts? Yeah, uh, I mean, in the last half a year, I got really frustrated with this whole process. Okay, I hire someone, do, you know, he does my work or she, or, you know. And I really try to understand. Now, I really spend a lot of time last few months trying to understand and you're starting to code and to, you know, because I think this collaboration, you know, it's a problem for understanding. And understanding the context, understanding possibilities within this context. And even, you know, here I'm kind of surprised because we are all coming from very different contexts. And I necessarily don't know much about, like, design. I mean, probably you don't know much about contemporary art. And also, what I was frustrated a few months ago, that I don't know much about, like, programming, and especially, like, machine learning. So, you know, how much do we have to come together sure. in exact to understand each other and to understand what participation really yeah. is, you know? Mm, especially, you know, and especially, like, the question of, like, you know, you know, you know Building models, building, you know, trying to think what they really do. You know, it's not, it's quite a complex thing. And how much of my time will I really dedicate to this yeah. question? That, that's a super interesting frame. Uh, so the question on some level ultimately is how much do you need to learn in order to, yeah. to collaborate to effectively? understand each other, to yeah. kind of participate, you know. I mean, on the level of like, you know, party or like, you know, we can dance together, right? You know, oh, absolutely. You know, if, I, if I have to, you know, if I have to build them like certain, you know, model, you know, machine learning model, it's like, you know, then it becomes a little bit a challenge, right? Sure. Because I would really like to know what's in there <laughs> and understand what it sure. does, sure. right? Uh, it, it, it's funny because I, as a choreographer, I have similar questions about dance, actually. So it's, it's like the machine learning is, it's, it's, is a black box of a certain kind. Yeah. Um, but choreography, and especially social dancing, which is totally mysterious to me as an elite, highly trained conservatory dancer, <laughs> like, um, <laughs> is, is a source of some anxiety, but also wanting to know or wanting to understand. Yeah. Um, other well, thoughts? Uh, please. <clears throat> uh, to quickly address the, the question of how we, um, what kind of guidance we got from Watson, so we were looking at some of the bigger questions of, of, of the community, right? And uh, are, they, are they spiritual? Are they adventurous? Um, do they love risks? Um, and it came down to like understanding if they're more extroverted or, or, or more introverted leaning. Uh, and those were the, the questions that we were coding for to help understand what path they would take. Um, I can go much deeper into all those details, uh, but for the sake of time, I'll save that for a question at the end. Uh, one thing that we were really proud of is understanding the extroverts versus introverts in the room and making sure that no one felt labeled inside and that they were all feeling really connected. And one thing that we did uh, was use that information to create functionality on the dance floor, where if you were looking at the floor and you were like, you're super fascinated by this, these designs under you, um, you would notice that when you got closer to other people, there would be rings that would come, come around both of you that would encourage you to dance more in groups and connect with one another and then look up at each other. So it's like, like, I'm around this person, and you look up and you have this meaningful moment with that person. Um, so that was one of the, the main, main things we coded for. I just want to put a pin in functionality on the dance floor, and I don't know if we can request t-shirts with that on it. <laughs> Maybe we can just do that. Um, I, I love that. Um, that commingling of a, of a kind of expressive and um, sort of community-centered moment that is augmented and um, literally framed by the technology. It was, uh, it was, it was a first for us. Okay. Um, but one thing, as just chiming yeah. off of what you're saying. Other thoughts uh, for t-shirts, maybe? <laughs> this, could, this actually could go on a t-shirt. I think so. Uh, so when we are thinking about designing an experience for people that are, have never, that call themselves, uh, or that say that, they, they never dance, they can't dance, uh, but you're also creating experience for really advanced dancers like yourself. Um, we had to create one that, was, that, uh, that would bring them together in a really special way. So uh, we, when you think about creating the experience um, and the science behind it, uh, 
they're trying to get as many of the happy chemicals to fire so that they're really able to interact with one another. And when we were unscrambling, uh, when Rada was unscrambling uh, these happy chemicals, we realized that uh, it spells dose, dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, and endorphins, which is uh, crazy for a sober early morning dance party. When you think about going to get like when you get your drugs at the pharmacy or elsewhere, uh, that you're ha- you're enabling yourself to release your own dose, right? And so when you're at Daybreaker, uh, you're able to get your dopamine from this early morning accomplishment and your oxytocin from having this hugging train at the entrance and then throwing away handshakes and only having hugs on the dance floor. And your serotonin from really feeling valued as part of a community member from either the MC speaking to you or having these sober interactions with other people and actually going deep with them. And your endorphins from burning 500 to 1,000 plus calories on the dance floor, right? And so uh, when you're creating your these your, these interactive pieces, really thinking about the experience that they're, that they're having around it um, and trying to get as many of these uh, happy chemicals to fire so that they can have an emotionally resonant moment. Um, and that's really what, when you feel that way at Daybreaker, it, it makes you say, you throw out that, like, you know, you leave Daybreaker saying, I can dance. I am confident um, going out dancing at night without anything else. Yeah. Um, I, I, I love how your uh, sort of experiential frame for this work is both not about drugs, but also very, very, very much about drugs. <laughs> um, uh, I want to uh, toss this to uh, Carl, and then I'll, I'll take a question from the website. I was just going to give a more geeky answer to the coding question. Yeah. I can step back. I, I write most of my own software. I use OpenCL, OpenGL for GPU programming. I don't know if you guys use GPUs out there, but it's fun these days because they're so CL. fast. Yay. Yeah. Guys, no. um, and then C++ and so on. Um, in another life, I created software tools for special effects. Um, so coding is kind of my main thing in a way. Artist is the, the fun part on the side. Okay. Yes, Lucy. And I kind of want to add on to what Carl said about uh, programming myself because um, I program most of my projects myself as well, but in a very different sense. Whereas, like, I don't know anything. I'm trying to learn everything, and like, some like 90% of the time, like, I end up somewhere where it's like, "Ooh, I did not know I did that," and I like it. So that kind of situation. So I think, uh, as my approach to uh, algorithms and programming projects. I think it's beca- like it's from a perspective where it's like I'm not expecting anything as a result and just kind of have it guide me because I feel like that's an important part of interaction design as well. Like from the back end, whereas like I'm interacting with the code in my own way and I'm seeing the code interact with the end user in another way and that very like triangulated, like almost crossover relationship mm-hmm. was something that was really interesting to me. Like this, and this can be like very easily applied to like dance, choreography, or like other mixed media mm-hmm. projects that I think yeah. Sure. Well, I love that because you're, you're speaking to the kind of interaction design and experience design of your own artistic practice um, and a kind of coding for serendipity that you yourself value. Um, I want to take it back uh, to Anonymous, um, who's posing a lot of questions, if I'm being honest. Um, contingency planning um, and uh, complicity of the uh, audience uh, in uh, the relationship, uh, in relationship to an object in its creation. Um, can we talk about how the audience is implicated or is complicit in your work? Uh, and maybe more extent, uh, by extension, the relationship of uh, your audience and maybe more specifically of the bodies of those uh, participating uh, and your work. And if it involves drugs, then great. Also, non-drug answers are fine. <laughs> <clears throat> well, at Daybreaker, wow. <laughs> It is all about the audience and uh, the moments that they exchange with one another, and what we what we 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 think about uh, all these moments with uh, with ritual, right? And uh, both at the entrance and the exit, um, and on the dance floor. But some of the things that we like to that we like to include at every single event when you when you arrive, instead of having mean bouncers at the door like you do when you go out at night, you have a hugging train, right? And this this first interaction is kind of when you throw out everything you know about what, how you're supposed to meet someone at, at, a, at a social setting, right? So when you get hugged by somebody else, now you're on the dance floor hugging all the new people that you meet, right? And so it's not really creating rules for the event, but uh, creating uh, these frameworks and culture um, and setting that tone right from the beginning. Um, another thing that we uh, that we love doing is... Um, 
saying things during during the experience that we, you know we're not trying to narrate the experience for everybody, um, but we are trying to help them break free, right? And uh, and so little like giving little guidance um, to the people that are actually speaking to the audience um, and helping people not judge themselves and things like that and things that they would never hear when they go out to the clubs, um, but also have this moment where they're like feeling really connected to themselves and to the, everyone, everyone around them uh, has been huge for creating transformational moments for people on the dance floor. Uh, and so really just thinking about the small tidbits that, um, that can create uh, deeper unlocking and help them ask bigger questions and why they're, why they're there, why they're showing up. And what they want to get out of thing, get hug, out of it. Hug as technology. Exactly. Yeah. Human yeah. technology. Like, like social grease in a way. Like, how is an audience complicit? In 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 some cases, I can say in some of my work, like the the piece is alive and it happens when people interact with it. So there is a there is a chance that the piece is there and no one's playing with it. No one is showing up or they're walking up and they're they're confused. Yeah. So like I think to your point, Eli, like how do you how do you help people get past where they might just be looking at something and be unsure, without actually saying you know, well, here's a pamphlet about our thing. You know, how do you, how do you avoid that, like, too much structure, but still kind of find a social elixir that just kind of says, like, oh, oh. In one case, for one of my pieces, it would be to hand people a pair of drumsticks. Not say anything else, but, like, yes, you're a stranger. I don't know you. You're here with two kids yeah. on the street. Here's some drumsticks. Let's just wail. Yeah. yeah. And, and, then, and then hopefully the piece is, like, structured in a way that that then turns into something meaningful. Sure. Um, but that's the, like, some, sometimes it does take that. Like, you know, what, how do you open doors without actually having to lead people all the way through, sure. but kind of say, like, here's some doors. Sure. As opposed to, like, an Ikea manual of, of interactive art. <laughs> I have a very similar situation with some of my pieces where if someone's using it, other people see that, they see how it works, then they get in there and start using it as well. But when, if no one's using it at a particular moment, it's not as interesting because it's really dependent on the people using it. And so how do you draw people in when no one's using it? So one, one thing I tried, which was interesting, is you have a different mode when it detects that no one's using it, and it starts doing stuff kind of on its own. But then as soon as someone steps up, it stops that and lets only their interaction be the thing that's doing it. So you're not creating too much structure over what people would be creating on their own. Mm -hmm. So it changes its mode when someone's using it and not using it to attempt to solve exactly that kind of problem. Or an invitation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm told by the um, thing in front of us that we have seven minutes and ten seconds left in our, our panel. Uh, I'm going to take that literally. Um, and I'm going to ask you uh, all one uh, more question uh, from the board, and then I'm going to invite you to tell our audiences uh, first where folks can find more information about you, uh, and then secondly, if you had any hard-won uh, trench-fought uh, guidance or um, uh, knowledge to impart um, on uh, the folks in the audi audience, um, what that would be. So that's coming in a moment. Um, but I, I love this question, um, again, by Anonymous. Uh, can you tell about a project you felt failed and what you took from it? Can we do like kind of a lightning round of failure? Can we just quickly go down and talk about our favorite failures and what you took away from that project or that failure? Unless I'm the only one who's ever failed, which is possible. Look, I think uh, <laughs> I think the general question could be like, if the, is there something like uh, too much participation? Uh -huh. If there is some... If there are limits sure. to participation, because my you know my experience is that you know it's sometimes especially in, in the frame of contemporary art, you know I think this participatory moment became almost problematic uh -huh. because and especially you know going back to this kind of problem is of institution like mm -hmm. how you know because if you're if you if you control if you're a company or if, or if you have a group of people and you don't really belong to any institution and kind of you try to establish your own rules, I think that's fine. But immediately, when you depend on someone, mm -hmm. you know this can become become quite weird. Sure. And how do you manage people? How do you really tell them what they can do and what they cannot do? And of course, and then you can you're faced you can be faced with a failure where people you know, are confused and don't even want to participate. Sure. Uh, so maybe there's like two questions buried in there. The first is how you handle dependencies, but also secondly, um, what kinds of rules can scale uh, yeah. and to what point? Yeah. Thank you. Um, other meditations on failure, um, either yours or those you have observed in my career or other people's <laughs> careers. <laughs> Um, I guess I kind of want to rephrase the question as Please. to uh, how do you really define failure? 
because almost all of my projects ended up somewhere that wasn't supposed to be mm -hmm. at all. Yeah, um, I mean, take an example of a project that I'm currently working on. I've been working a lot with ceramics lately, with um, slip casting mostly, and just because I had various issues with my mold and it ends up being like very like overflowing, cracked, etc. Like it, oh, like by trying to fix everything, um, it's like now it's turned into like this very morphic, like weird object that I find like almost inspiring for some reason. So I guess the process, like the process, like do you really take failure as failure or like another opportunity to kind of go further? Like maybe stepping into a disciplinary where you're not familiar with or maybe like try to combine it with the past knowledge into like creating something that's very like abstract and that could potentially open new fields. Like, sure. yeah, because failure is a relative term. Sure, and, and maybe one that's attitudinally defined. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I, I, I agree with that. I think it's important to start lots of projects, many of which you might not finish. Just go for it, right? Don't be scared to start a project just because it might fail because it doesn't matter. You just don't, you don't finish, you do something else, that's fine. It's, especially these days, I mean, uh, if taken from, from an old timer where computing used to be really expensive and really slow relative to the way it is now, you guys have it really easy. Um, so Congratulations. Just, you know, go and, go and do it, whatever it might be, whether you finish it or not. Thank you. Uh, Ali. Well, one way in which uh, you could say perhaps failure uh, could be defined is that if you take too much advice from people, they may have very different opinions about what you are doing and that might give you a very different sense of which direction you should be going. So I think it's important to have a very clear um, understanding of why you are doing something and uh, you have to be careful who you take advice from and how you incorporate sure. that into your um, project. So an, a project I was working on about two years ago was a context awareness system for mobile devices. And that's a project that sort of ended up being finished, sort of not completely, but one of the um, uh, um, obstacles that I found with that project is that after I tried um, pursuing it more as a, as a product than just a a research project, I ended up getting very conflicting advice from uh, VCs and from uh, some of the uh, um, uh, people in business I interacted with about whether this would be a project that can be uh, um, pursued as, as a real startup or whether it should be just confined to a research project. So that's, that's one project I ended up not pursuing as a, as a product because I got a, a lot of conflicting advice, but even today I still think that was a mistake and I probably should have continued forward. Wait. I think that that's such a fascinating conversation for another panel or another conversation about uh, the role of mentorship and the constellation of resources and people that inform uh, all of our work. But also your point is very well taken. I don't trust anything that comes out of a panel. <laughs> um, Ryan, did you have a, a quick everything thought? you've heard today. I know, this is all lies and garbage. Um, I have a quick one just on failure, which yeah. is instead of being specific in, in general, for me it has been, um, times when I took uh, someone's resume or reputation or skill over the relationship that I had with them mm -hmm. um, when developing work. And I think for most of us, and I'm probably everyone, I hope everyone in this room, the work that you're working on is like important and you're filled with passion and it's personal and it's public and it's me, you know, it's all those things. So then the people you work with, you should love and want to work with them because if everything goes really well, you'll stay up late hanging out with them and then you'll take it on the road. And you know what I'm saying? Like, hopefully those things happen, and then hopefully you're gonna wanna hang with them because your relationship is the thing that's forward. And, and if the people around you, you know, like you have to be honest with yourself if, if you're not feeling it. Yeah. I think even if we're writing code and doing, you know, like if it's, even if electricity is involved, you still have to feel good about the people you're with. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, on that note, we have literally 23 seconds before uh, we, I guess, all get kicked off the stage, I guess, um, so, uh, physically and literally. So what I'm gonna invite us uh, now to do is share uh, a, a place where folks uh, in the audience can get a little bit more information about your work and very, very, very briefly, uh, some piece of uh, maybe advice or guidance that you'd like to impart on our audience, go. And we're out of time. 
You can find it. <laughs> uh, so we're actually looking to do a daybreaker here at MIT. Uh, you can come talk to us right over here after after this. It's coming up this later this fall. But uh, you can find more on Instagram at, at DYBRKR or daybreaker.com. And I'll be here to talk about any questions you have as well. Okay. Uh, some wisdom is when thinking about every experience that you create, do think about it through what uh, what you want people to feel. and. Uh, that's going to be the most important thing for people to have an emotional connection to what you're creating. Um, if you want this creation to live live longer, uh, that's how they're going to start talking about it and create this create sharing. Okay. Um, pass it down. That we now have a blinking light of some kind, and I'm getting very nervous. So please, one one uh, piece of advice I would ask for everyone uh, uh, is to think about including as many people as uh, you can in. Uh, your interactive experiences. So specifically think about people who may not have the full set of abilities that a normal person might have. Um, and uh, as, as for where you can find more of my uh, upcoming and recent work, uh, I'm here downstairs, literally, in this building. So you're always welcome to come talk to me. And I update my website about uh, once a year, which is my last name, .com. Thank you. Uh, you can find out more information at carlsims.com. And my advice would be just, you know, take risks and do what you love to do. Amen. So my advice as someone who doesn't know what she's doing most of the time is that is completely okay because new media is all about finding out who we are and who we interact with and how to really bring that into art and design and tech. Um, to find out more about me, uh, you can literally just Google me. The, re the search that doesn't come out as a real estate agent in California is probably me. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that happens, yeah. Um, yeah, and I'm on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I'm at the Media Lab. Tuesday, Thursday, I'm at Harvard. The rest of the time, I'm kind of floating around Cambridge, so if you catch me, Say hi. Great. I, I love that your response was, if I'm not at Harvard or MIT, just Google me. <laughs> Thank you. Please. Yeah, you can find more information on my web website. And, um, and regarding advice, I try to kind of, I, I, I feel I give too much advice all the time. So no, no advice this time. <laughs> Cheers. Oh, man. <laughs> You're like the dark horse up here, man. Um, uh, my studio is called Masari Studios. You see it there, um, masaristudios.com. We're based here in Boston, and one of my pieces is actually out here in the lobby, and I have business cards and, and brochures if you'd like to check it out and hang uh, um, here this afternoon. Great. Folks, thank you so much. Give it up for Sydney for being funny and roping it all together, though, right? Good job, buddy. Well, uh, thank you. I don't know that that's ever happened before, man. Uh, please give a warm round of applause for my esteemed... Panelists, give it up. Thank you so much. Mazel, mazel. And uh, to be continued, shameless plug. Are you going to give the shameless plug, or should I give the shameless plug? Shameless plug uh, for my own workshop session that started 15 minutes ago. Uh, 